we will cover an approach to upper GI bleeding. So the presentation of upper GI bleeding can be hematemesis, which is blood in the vomit. The blood can be red if it's fresh, or it can look like brown specks, which is described as coffee ground emesis. And there's melina, which is black or tarry looking stool. And lastly, we have hematochesia. Uh, hematochesia is frank red blood in the stool. And that's more common in lower GI bleed, but it's also possible if you have a brisk or massive upper GI bleed. So an upper GI bleed is defined as bleeding in the GI tract anywhere that's proximal to the ligament of trites, which is located in the duodenum. Next we have the differential. So the first list is causes that are actually upper GI bleeding. So this is esophageal trauma, uh, in which includes Mallory Weiss tear. It's frequent in patients that are vomiting a lot and they have a resultant uh, esophageal tear. This is esophagitis and gastritis, which includes alcoholic gastritis, esophageal and gastric varices, gastric and duodenal ulcers, vascular abnormalities, including dulafoids lesion, and that's a congenital uh, submucosal vessel. It's very large, located usually in the stomach, that when it erodes, it uh, bleeds. And then there's tumors and Crohn's disease. Um, also on your differential should be non-upper GI bleed causes. So epistaxis or a nosebleed. There's hemoptysis. And there's vomiting without actual bleeding. Um, and of course, also consider a lower GI bleed. Now the most common of all these, first of all, is peptic ulcer disease, and second is esophageal gastric varices. And these two combined uh, make up almost 75% of all the upper GI bleeding that you'll see. Now because upper GI bleeding can be a medical emergency, you need to do an initial look test before you start your formal internal medicine consult, which can take a couple hours. So often the look test is already done by the resident before you see the patient, but it's good to do it yourself so you have practice. So the look test, first of all, you need to do your ABCs. So assess their airways, breathing, and circulation. Note if they're ill-looking and if they're in any distress. You need their vitals, so you're looking for an increase of their heart rate, increase of rest rate, decrease in saturation, and any low blood pressure. And so tests that you can order immediately include a CBC for their hemoglobin, an INR, PTT, and group and cross match uh, two or more units depending on uh, how sick or how ill they are. And then do an ECG and a troponin as well. So you've done the look test and ordered the labs that you need immediately, then you can loop back around and do the history and physical because then you'll have ample time to do so. Next, we have the history and physical, and so always keep in mind your differential diagnosis, and that'll guide what questions to ask on history and what to do on your physical. So things to highlight, uh, you need to characterize the bleeding. Um, so describe it. Is it uh, red? Is it brown? What does it look like? How much blood is there? And uh, was there any retching at all? And also have there been any previous episodes of bleeding because the most common place to bleed is somewhere that has bled before ask them if they have any constitutional symptoms that could uh, suggest a malignancy and on review of systems so are they dizzy um, do they feel confused any pain or any palpitations at all a past medical history ask them about varices any liver disease or portal hypertension and alcohol abuse. Ask them about the surgery, so uh, AAA or previous grafts, those may lead to a higher risk of rebleeding. Any peptic ulcer disease or uh, any positive H. pylori tests in the past, uh, any vascular disease, malignancy, and coagulopathies. And for medications, uh, don't forget to ask about anticoagulants, antiplatelets like aspirin, uh, NSAIDs, and also there are things that can be uh, melina mimics. So bismuth, uh, iron, and charcoal 
all these things can change the color of your stool. Next we have the physical exam. So we've already assessed for hemodynamic stability by doing ABCs, vitals, and giving oxygen if necessary. The next thing we can do is look for orthostatic hypotension. So there's the 10, 20, 30 rule. Basically, you need to take their blood pressure when they're lying down and take it again when they're standing up within two minutes. If their diastolic blood pressure decreases by 10, or their systolic decreases by 20, or their heart rate increases by 30, then you have positive orthostatic um, hypotension. In general, with the physical, you need to look for signs of hypovolemia and hypoperfusion. So things that can help include cold extremities, pallor, an increased uh, cap refill, sunken eyes, dry axilla or mucous membranes. And most importantly, a decreased JVP, which means a decreased uh, intravascular volume. You can look for liver disease manifestations and also do a rectal exam and a fecal occult blood test. And definitely a good abdominal exam is necessary. If they have an acute abdomen, that could possibly mean there's a perforation and that they need surgery. Next, we'll talk about approach and investigations. So at this point, after you've done the history and the physical you can use um, one of the scoring systems associated with upper GI bleeding. And first is the Blatchford score, and that measures the risk of needing treatment to manage upper GI bleed, so transfusion or endoscopy. And a score of less than six is low risk, and six or greater is a high risk. And this is based on their presentation and the comorbidities. And I haven't outlined the actual um, things that the Black Blatchford score is looking for, but what I recommend is you download the uh, medical calculator app on your phone and it'll be available for you uh, whenever you need it. It's probably not worth memorizing at this point. And the other one is the Rockall score. And that is for adverse outcomes after an acute G upper GI bleed. So three or less is a good prognosis and eight or more means there's a high risk of mortality. And this was based on their present patient presentation and also their endoscopy findings. So this one you probably do later on after you decided that they need an endoscopy. So we'll talk about lab tests next. So in terms of blood work, you need to do a CBC for the hemoglobin and platelets, um, electrolytes, uh, check their renal function, uh, PTT and INR liver function tests, bilirubin, and albumin. Definitely get an ECG in troponins, and that's so you can rule out a cardiac event um, because that is possible in situations of severe stress and bleeding. You can do imaging, so a, C a chest x-ray, that can often rule out something like an esophageal rupture, and H. pylori testing, and there's also an option to do a tagged RBC scan. Now, in many different uh, textbooks, you read that an NG tube is often the first step in evaluating an upper GI bleed. But actually, it's not useful to determine the bleeding source. And it's only recommended on up-to-date uh, to be used for facilitating an endoscopy, meaning before an endoscopy, if you need to remove fresh blood or clots from the stomach, that's what you need an NG tube for. Otherwise, the most important uh, diagnostic and therapeutic tool is an upper endoscopy. So it's diagnostic. It has a high sensitivity and specificity for locating the bleeding. And once you find it, you can uh, treat it as well. So you can achieve acute hemostasis and prevent recurrent bleeding of a peptic ulcer disease. And you can do that with thermal coagulation or injection therapy or clips. And you can also treat varices by sclerotherapy and band ligation. And so other tests, we can also do angiography that's use only useful if they're actively bleeding. And we mentioned the tagged RBC scan, uh, also for active bleeding. And 
just a note that you should not do upper GI barium in imaging for acute upper GI bleeds because it can interfere with other procedures, especially surgery, if you're planning to do that. And next we have management. The first thing you need to do is obtain two large bore IVs, so 16 gauges or more. And peripheral is preferred, but if that's not possible, you can also get a central venous catheter. Keep them NPO in case they need to go to surgery or you need to do a scope uh, right away. And admit them into somewhere that has continuous monitoring. So that can be in the ICU or a step-down unit or anywhere where um, you'll be monitoring them very frequently. Most important thing is fluid resuscitation. That's why you put in the IVs. Uh, you may need to put in a Foley to monitor their urine output. And in addition to fluids, so giving a normal saline most of the time, you need to consider blood transfusion. And that's based on clinical judgment. Uh, you need to get their hemoglobin levels, compare it to their previous values. And if you think it's an acute drop that might um, benefit from blood, then you give blood. And also consider uh, FFP, so platelets. Um, Often, if there is a massive bleed, like requiring six or more units, you do need to also uh, provide the patient with platelets. Then we have medications. So often a PPI will be uh, started empirically. It's given by IV until the cause is identified. Um, what it does is it reduces re-bleeding. And what we usually give is pentoprazole, an 80 milligram IV bolus, and then an 8 milligram per hour infusion. Another class of drugs we use is prokinetics, so if erythromycin and metoclopramide. And those are used for improved visualization during endoscopy. And these are drugs that often GI will order and uh, uh, you don't have to worry about. And then there's octreotide, so that's a somatostatin analog that's used to treat a variceal bleed and decrease the risk of uh, bleeding. Octreotide works by inhibiting the release of glucagon and other vasodilators. That results in splanchnic vasoconstriction and decreases portal inflow. Lastly, in terms of medications, you need to discontinue any drugs that could be making things worse, like ASA, NSAIDs, and anticoagulants. Lastly, you need to consult the appropriate teams. So GI can do the endoscopy, interventional radiology for angiographic intraarterial vasopressin or embolization, general surgery for exploratory laparotomy, and ICU for a balloon tamponade in variceal bleeds. All right, and that's it for the approach to upper GI bleeding. So if you have any questions, please email me at approach to internal medicine at gmail.com. Uh, please like the video if you feel like you've learned anything and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to be kept up to date with the approaches that I'll be re releasing in the future. And uh, thanks for tuning in.